Gentlemen, the Vice President and I are pleased, very pleased, to welcome you to our press conference. We'll now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council, which was also attended by the Commission Vice President, Mr. Dombrovskis. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We continue to expect them to remain at present or lower levels for an extended period of time and well past the horizon of our net asset purchases. Regarding non-standard monetary policy measures, we confirm that the monthly asset purchases of 80 billion euros are intended to run until the end of March 2017 or beyond if necessary, and in any case until the Governing Council sees a sustained adjustment in the path of inflation consistent with its inflation aim. Today, we focus developments since our last monetary policy meeting in early June. Following the UK referendum on EU membership, our assessment is that euro area financial markets have weathered the spike in uncertainty and volatility with encouraging resilience. The announced readiness of central banks to provide liquidity if needed and our, own, our accommodative monetary policy measures, as well as a robust regulatory and supervisory framework, have all helped to keep market stress contained. Financing conditions remain highly supportive, which contributes to a strengthening in credit creation. They continue to support our baseline scenario of an ongoing economic recovery and an increase in inflation rates. At the same time, given prevailing uncertainties, the Governing Council will continue to monitor economic and financial market developments very closely and to safeguard the pass-through of its accommodative monetary policy to the real economy. Over the coming months, when we have more information, including new staff projections, we will be in a better position to reassess the underlying macroeconomic conditions, the most likely paths of inflation and growth, and the distribution of risks around those paths. If warranted to achieve its objective, the Governing Council will act by using all the instruments available within its mandate. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. Euro area real GDP increased by 0.6% quarter on quarter in the first quarter of 2016, after 0.4% in the last quarter of 2015. Growth continues to be supported by domestic demand while export growth has remained modest. Incoming data point to ongoing growth in the second quarter of 2016, though at a lower rate than in the first quarter. Looking ahead, we continue to expect the economic recovery to proceed at a moderate pace. Domestic demand remains supported by the pass-through of our monetary policy measures to the real economy. Favorable financing conditions and improvements in corporate profitability continue to promote a recovery in investment. Sustained employment gains, which are also benefiting from past structural reforms and, st and still relatively low oil prices, provide additional support for households' real disposable income and thus for private consumption. In addition, the fiscal stance in the euro area is expected to be mildly expansionary in 2016 and to turn broadly neutral in 2017 and 2018. At the same time, headwinds to the economic recovery in the euro area include the outcome of the UK referendum, 
and other geopolitical uncertainties, subdued growth prospects in emerging markets, the necessary balance sheet adjustments in a number of sectors, and a sluggish pace of implementation of structural reforms. Against this background, the risks to the euro area growth outlook remain tilted to the downside. According to Eurostat, euro area annual HICP inflation in June 2016 was 0.1% up from minus 0.1% in May, mainly reflecting higher energy and services price inflation. Looking ahead on the basis of current futures price for prices for oil, inflation rates are likely to remain very low in the next few months before starting to pick up later in 2016, in large part owing to base effects in the annual rate of change of energy prices. Supported by our monetary policy measures and the expected economic recovery, Inflation rates should increase further in 2017 and 2018. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money, M3, continued to increase at robust pace in May 2016, with its annual rate of growth standing at 4.9% after 4.6% in April. As in previous months, annual growth in M3 was mainly supported by its most liquid components with a narrow monetary aggregate M1 expanding at an annual rate of 9.1% in May after 9.7% in April. Loan dynamics followed a path of gradual recovery observed since the beginning of 2014. The annual rate of change of loans to non-financial corporations increased to 1.4% in May 2016, compared with 1.2% in April. Developments in loans to enterprises continue to reflect the lagged relationship with the business cycle, credit risk, and the ongoing adjustment of financial and non-financial sector balance sheets. The annual growth rate of loans to households remained broadly stable at 1.6% in May after 1.5% in April. The Euro Area Bank Lending Survey for the second quarter of 2016 indicates further improvements in loan supply conditions for loans to enterprises and households and a continued increase in loan demand across all loan categories. Furthermore, banks continued to report that the targeted longer-term refinancing operations had contributed to a more favorable terms and conditions on loans. The monetary policy measures in place since June 2014 have significantly improved borrowing conditions for firms and households, as well as credit flows across the euro area. The comprehensive package of new monetary policy measures adopted in March this year underpins the ongoing upturn in loan growth, thereby suggesting, thereby supporting the recovery of the real economy. In the light of the prevailing uncertainties, it is essential that the bank lending channel continues to function well. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed the need to preserve an appropriate degree of monetary accommodation in order to secure a, re a return of inflation rates towards levels that are below but close to 2% without undue delay. Monetary policy is focused on maintaining price stability over the medium term, and its accommodative stance supports economic activity. As emphasized repeatedly by the Governing Council, 
and as again strongly echoed in both European and international policy discussions, in order to reap the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute much more decisively, both at the national and at European level. The implementation of structural reforms needs to be substantially stepped up to reduce structural unemployment and boost potential output growth in the euro area. Structural reforms are necessary in all euro area countries, although specific reform needs, specific reform needs differ across individual economies. The focus should be on actions to raise productivity and improve the business environment, including the provision of an adequate public infrastructure which are vital to increase investment and boost job creation. The enhancement of current invest investment initiatives, including the extension of the Juncker Plan, progress on the Capital Markets Union, and reforms that will improve the resolution of non-performing loans will also contribute positively to this objective. In an environment of accommodative monetary policy, the swift and effective implementation of structural reforms in line with the 2016 country-specific recommendations recently, recently approved by the European Council will not only lead to higher sustainable economic growth in the euro area, but will also make the euro area more resilient to global shocks. Fiscal policies should also support the economic recovery while remaining in compliance with the fiscal rules of the European Union. Full and consistent implementation of the Stability and Growth Pact over time and across countries is crucial to maintain confidence in the fiscal framework. At the same time, all countries should strive for a more growth-friendly composition of fiscal policies. We are now at your disposal for questions. Ms. Jones. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, Brexit has revived concerns that you will run out of bonds to buy for the quantitative easing programme. Um, did the Governing Council consider today whether to relax the rule, or was there any discussion of whether to relax the rules for government bond purchases, including potentially moving from the capital key rule? And would the governing council consider buying either equities or bank debt under QE? Thank you. Thank you. As I said before, uh, we discussed the basically uh, the general, uh, the general economic conditions, we concluded that we didn't have yet uh, information to take uh, decisions. And um, we decided, as I said, that over the coming months, when we have more information, including new staff projections, we'll be in a better position to reassess the underlying macroeconomic conditions. And uh, no attention was, was really given to discuss specific instruments at this point in time. Mr. Merli. Uh, the um, IMF, in its recent update of the um, world economic outlook, uh, singled out uh, Italian and Portuguese banks as one of the risks for the outlook. Is that a view that you share? Is one of the risks that you're taking into account in your considerations? And uh, do you think that uh, some degree of public support for banks in the Eurozone is acceptable or indeed desirable? Well, uh, what, I, what I just said in the, in the introductory statement, uh, um, monetary policy is uh, certainly supportive of economic activity and is focused on maintaining price stability but uh, also other policy measures are needed to, in order to reap the full benefits of our monetary policy. And uh, one of them is to address the non-performing loans, non more generally non-performing exposures in, uh, in the euro area. And so that is a very important reform. 
and uh, we, certainly, we certainly consider it important. I wouldn't say we consider it a risk, as you said, but, uh, but certainly it has to, be, has to be addressed. Now, it's a complex problem. We may actually come back on it later on. And what's the other question? Well, we have, we have in place the rules. We have in place rules on state aid. We have the BRRD. And as I said several times, these rules contain uh, all the flexibility to cope with exceptional circumstances, the power and the responsibility in activating these rules and in complying with these rules lies with the commission. Ms. Trick? Thank you very much, uh, Johanna Trick with MNI. Um, I believe you have the uh, survey of professional forecasters available, and I was wondering whether that was conducted after Brexit um, and what those shows, whether that had uh, an impact on the uh, growth and inflation forecasts. Um, and you've said repeatedly that you, know, you, you need more data and you need more time to assess the, the exact impact. But it seems to be generally that in most observers expect it to be a question of, of when and how much you might act. So do you think that um, people who assume that uh, Going um, running ahead a, bit, a little bit, is there a fa fair chance that you've actually done enough? Thank you. Well, on, on the on the first uh, on the first point, uh, um, I frankly I can't remember whether a survey was done before or after. What I know is that the on inflation outlook, uh, the Brexit didn't seem to have any major impact at the point at this point in time. Uh, since we speak about inflation expectations, it's worthwhile pointing out that uh, we have um, a kind of increasing divergence between the SPF expectations and the market-based expectations. The SPF expectations basically remain the same. It's 0 0.3 this year, 1.2 next year, 1.5 in uh, 2018, uh, and 1 1.8 uh, is, the, uh, is the expectation, the medium long-term expectation of the SPF. So pretty anchored. Uh, on the other hand, we had the market-based inflation expectations, which uh, in uh, the days immediately after Brexit fell significantly. And um, we, uh, I mean, one, one immediate explanation was that uh, there are technical factors uh, that caused such a, a decline, namely that the impact on nominal bond yields was bigger than the impact on the linkers. And, and that, that reinforced this effect. On the other hand, uh, even when the market sentiment recovered, we haven't really witnessed a rec an equal and a similar recovery of the inflation, of the market-based inflation expectations. So, Again, we can't say much about this at this stage. We need a little more time to assess the, what is the uh, state of the market-based inflation expectations. On your second question, I, I just simply reiterate what, uh, what I said before. I said that over the coming months, when we have more information, including new staff projections, we will be in a better position to reassess the underlying macroeconomic conditions uh, and uh, likely paths and so on. Uh, but there is one last sentence that I want to stress in response to your answer, to your question. If warranted to achieve its objective, the governing council will act by using all instruments available within its mandate. So I would want to stress readiness, willingness, ability to do so. Mr. Malin. Uh, Jan Marlin, Handelsblatt. Um, so far, um, banks have suffered most from, from Brexit, uh, it seems. Um, they are very important for the transmission of monetary policies, so do you see maybe there's some need to act? And my uh, second question is um, 
uh, concerning the um, at the moment the bond purchases are linked to the capital key. Would you outline to change that within uh, the nearby future? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll answer first question. I, you're right, banks are important, especially important for the Eurozone, which is basically a bank-based uh, economy uh, where the credit intermediation is mostly, goes mostly through the bank lending channel. Bank equities in the aftermath of the Brexit were especially hit, and, uh, and especially in the Eurozone, and especially those banks with a high share of NPLs, of non-performing loans. Equity prices, bank equity prices are of some significance for policymakers. Because when, if they drop in the way they did, one would assume that if this is to stay, cost of capital would increase, and therefore the net return on lending would decrease and would suggest on the banking side a more conservative lending behavior. That's why we do care about equity bank equity prices for the transmission of our monetary policy. But let's consider this in, in, in the uh, kind of in a little more, I would say, right perspective, but also medium term perspective. On the solvency side, our banks are better, if not much better, than they were before. Let me give you one number. The average CET1 used to be 9%. Oh, the CET1 for the 130 banks supervised by the, directly supervised by the, by the SSM was 9% in 2012, and it's around 13% today. So from a solvency viewpoint, one would conclude that a series of actions that have been undertaken in the last three, four years, like a new, new and regulation a supervision, as I said here, a robust supervisory system and regulatory design, but also a new harmonized classification, standard of classification of MPLs, and certainly substantial provisioning against these NPLs and other forms of, uh, of, uh, of weak parts of the balance sheet. And finally, the role that our monetary policy played in this period of time are the reasons why banks are today better, if not much better, than they were in 2009. So what is the problem? The problem now that we will have to address is the weak profitability ahead, not a problem of solvency. And uh, as you know, next week, on July 29th, the EBA will publish the outcome of the most recent stress test for 51 banks in the European Union, including 37 significant institutions directly supervised by the SSM. Moreover, the SSM has conducted the same stress test for an additional 56 banks under its direct supervision. And these stress tests will be one input to determine the pillar two supervisory capital demands by the end of this year. So then we, what about the MPLs? We said that the MPLs is certainly a significant problem for the future profitability and for the capacity, the ability that the banks have of lending. It's, uh, so it is a problem that needs to be addressed because it's an obstacle to the transmission of our monetary policy. And what uh, one would say that the solution of the MPL problem is based on three pillars. First of all, a consistent supervisory approach Second, the development of uh, a full functioning NPL market. And third, government action in uh, 
first of all, passing that legislation that would foster the development of an NPL market. And, uh, and this certainly involves the an, um, sort of a revision of, of existing bankers, corporate and personal bankruptcy legislation, but also other, other actions. And, and possibly also having a public backstop when at times of uh, exceptional circumstances, the uh, MPL market uh, is not well functioning and certainly we want to avoid fire sales. The second question, no, the answer is no, we had no discussion about that. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Fairless. I'm sorry, w sorry, just don't wanna, I want to be very precise in the answer. What was the question? Because it's... No, no attention was given to that, no. Thank you. Thank you, Tom Fairless from the Wall Street Journal. Um, to, to go back to the effect of Brexit on the Eurozone, um, I, I understand the ECB thinks that it's going to hit growth by about half a percent over three years. Would that kind of, uh, assuming there was that kind of shock, would that be sufficient to extend the um, uh, bond purchases beyond March, which is uh, coming up fairly soon? Um, the second question is on the QE program. Um, assuming you did face scarcities in bond markets, how difficult do you think it would be to change the parameters? Do you see any uh, legal uh, challenges? Um, and are there, are there more legal challenges with changing the capital key, for instance, than um, uh, uh, dropping the deposit floor or, or taking another approach? Thanks. Now, on your first question, the, the figure that circulated was an impact of, in the, uh, circulated in the aftermath of Brexit was exactly what you said, an impact of uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 over three years. Um, the com I believe the commissions come out with a similar figure of 0 0.25 to 0 0.5. Um, I think we should take these, these estimates with, with some sort of grain of caution. Uh, I said it before, uncertainties, large uncertainties prevail because, first of all, these figures will, in the end, depend on how long is going to be the uh, stretch of time for these negotiations to be completed and, therefore, to give a certain outlook which we don't have with us today. And second, these figures will also depend on what kind of outcome is, is, is going to come out. The, so I think they, they have to be taken with a certain grain of caution. What is clear is that financial markets uh, and also the banking sector, in spite of the large changes in the, in the stock prices, have reacted in a fairly resilient fashion to the event. The, um, we haven't observed any, any disruption, neither in the financial markets sector nor in the banking sector. And this was certainly caused by the, uh, by the large liquidity being abundant, by the, also all the preparation that uh, all central banks have undertaken before ensuring that liquidity lines would be available, and, um, and certainly by the accommodative monetary policies uh, undertaken by all central banks uh, at the present time. But also because of, in a sense, what I was saying before, by the a more kind of robust uh, regulatory system all over the world. And that ensured ensure resilience by markets and, and banks. So I think it's, uh, it's too early to say what is going to be the final impact. The only thing we can say is that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a risk that's materialized and it's a downside risk. Uh, as far as your other question is concerned, is about the, the uh, I would say, the execution, the possible execution difficulties that our uh, QE program may, may have to face. Uh, well, first let me say that we, we view the, our QE program and our TELTRO program, all our monetary policy measures, has, has, as, as, as having been quite successful. 
They are underpinning the economic recovery. They are underpinning the return of inflation to uh, our objective. Second, as I had the opportunity to say before, we didn't give attention today about this on, on the discussion, to the discussion of, um, of specific instruments. But I mean, in the past, we've given enough evidence, not only of our readiness to act and uh, our willingness to act, but also to, uh, to, to be able to adapt our programs so as to reach the objective of a purchase of 80 billion euros a month until March 2017 and beyond if needed. And I think uh, in, uh, in, in worrying about the coming months, whether we'll be able to actually fulfill this objective or not, I think proper attention should be given to the, uh, the evidence that we've given in the past few months and our ability to exploit the flexibility that, our, that the design or our program gives us. Thank you. Mr. Speciale. Alessandro Speciale, Bloomberg News. Um, Mr. President, the ECB has recently published an article that illustrates its various ways of uh, estimating the output gap, which is a quite an elusive uh, uh, number, um, with a measure that was considered more robust, uh, pointing to a 6% output gap, which is bigger than most estimates. Um, my question is, uh, what is your the measure that you consider most convincing of the output gap? And uh, I mean, and what conclusions do you draw from, from that study? And my second question is, if you have already started considering uh, tapering or uh, other ways of closing the asset purchase, especially given the widespread expectation that the asset purchases will eventually be extended past March 17. Thank you very much. Thank you. I yes, I'm aware of that paper, of course. Uh, it's, a, it's an estimate of the output gap. As you yourself said, it's an elusive concept. There are several ways to estimate it. And uh, we do uh, take into account uh, the various definitions of output gap when we design our monetary policy, including the one you mentioned. It's, uh, that's, the, I think, the, 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 the answer to your question. You, you want to add? Uh, I'm sorry. Please. Thank you. Uh, just to add that uh, I had quoted that work of our experts last year in my speech at, uh, at Jackson Hole, among other also internal estimates of the output gap, which means that there is a whole range of uh, internal calculations with different models that go from uh, minus two to the uh, minus six. So we cannot really uh, make a choice uh, in a very uh, concrete way and saying this is better than the other one. By the way, this model that comes out with the 6%, simplifying it, uh, reaches that conclusion based on the assumption that the variables in the model would explain uh, what uh, has happened to inflation. And uh, to achieve that reverse engineer, then it concludes that the output gap should have been minus 6 in order to explain the inflation that actually happened. But that's totally model dependent. So uh, everything has to be uh, really uh, analyzed with all the uncertainties behind uh, such uh, a concept. The other, the other, your other question was about tapering. No, we have not discussed that. Mm. Mr. Perez? Hi. <clears throat> Claudi Perez from El País. Mr. Draghi, you said in this press room in the past that countries like Portugal or Spain have done substantial efforts in terms of structural reforms, uh, substantial efforts in terms of uh, structural reforms. Do you consider that a country like Spain, which has reduced the deficit from 11 to 5% of GDP, which has approved uh, labor 
uh, pension pen, uh, reforms, financial reforms deserve a sanction that can be counterproductive in economic and political terms. And do you think that the sanction could be a risk for the stability of the eurozone if uh, problems, if if we have problems in the Portuguese financial system or a change in the fiscal stance of the eurozone as a whole? Thank you. Uh, the decision about sanctioning Spain or other countries for, for this matter, excuse me, uh, is entirely in the hands of the Commission, which has, uh, as in uh, other cases, the responsibility, the power, and the knowledge to uh, take a decision. Mr. Kagawa. Shogua Kagawa, Japanese Nikkei. Um, the G20 meeting will be held this weekend in China. Um, what kind of message do you want to send to your colleagues at this upcoming meeting? And do you see another downside risk outside of the Europe? Thank you. The, um the message, the message that will probably come out is a message of um, renew. Well, the message that will come out, the message that I can foresee or expect to come out, will be a message of stability. And uh, the message that will come out specifically from the eurozone will be a message of a of a recovery that continues, though at a slower pace in the midst of uh, great uncertainties. Uncertainties that uh, are not only, or not especially actually, coming from the Eurozone, but uh, they come from uh, various parts of the world. And uh, in, a, in this climate of general uncertainty, not necessarily economic uncertainty, but probably mostly geopolitical uncertainty, it's very important uh, that a message of stability comes out of the G20. Policies are uh, everywhere very accommodative. The financial system and the banking system are stronger than they were before. And uh, so it's very important that a message like that comes out. Mrs. Mastroboni. Tonya Mastroboni, La Repubblica. Um, Mr. Draghi, uh, earlier this week, the Bundesbank made a proposal about uh, strengthening the role of the ESM in case of crisis of countries, especially when there is a restructuring of the debt needed. And um, basically, uh, the proposal is to rethink the Troika, or what is called the Troika, and in reality, it's a quartet. Uh, I was wondering what you think about this position, if there is a there was a discussion on this in, in, the, in the governing council, or what you think about this. And the second question is, um, how worried are you about the developments in Turkey? And how can s these developments, which are very worrying, I think, generally have an impact on the, on the recovery and on the situation in the Eurozone? Thank you. Thank you. On the first question, uh, we, as you know, we are uh, a part of the Troika because of legislation the six packs, the two packs that was passed years ago. At that time, there was a good reason for uh, involving the ECB in uh, the programs, in the program countries. Uh, the Eurozone didn't have any experience with uh, the new, with how to manage these situations. And so uh, it made sense to have uh, all, the, all the players in the IMF, the Commission, and the ECB. Um, it was also a good case for the ECB to be part of this because uh, so that the ECB could actually have information about the solvency and about the financial stability of what they were, the states where their the monetary policy counterparties would uh, reside. Now, through the years, 
uh, actors uh, have uh, acquired experience. And uh, the ECB, especially in the last uh, two years, have, has carved a role which is both minor and more specific to its capacities, to its skills, namely the financial and the banking sector in these countries. Now, to change the Troika, we need to change legislation. It's not our task. It's the European Parliament, it's the legislators, it's the ECOFIN, it's the Eurogroup, and so on. And so we are ready to give our contribution to, to that extent. On your second question, Turkey, um, it's very difficult to understand how these big geopolitical uncertainties would affect the recovery because the channels aren't obvious. Uh, even, it, for example, in the case of Brexit, there is an obvious channel, which is the trade channel. But is it the most relevant channel to express the impact of such an event on the Eurozone? One would rather think about the confidence channel or, for example, the financial service channels. Now, in the case of Turkey, it's, uh, it's very likely that all these events might affect the confidence, but uh, it's very difficult to foresee significant impact on the, Euro on the Eurozone recovery, at least in the, in the, in the, immediate, in the, medium, in the immediate future. Mr. Ewing? Uh, thank you, Jack Ewing from the New York Times. Um, I realize the corporate uh, the uh, uh, corporate bond buying uh, purchases have started fairly recently, but I'm wondering if you can give us an assessment of uh, whether it's met your expectations so far in uh, bringing you closer to your mandate. And also, I wonder, this may be kind of an obvious question, but I wonder if you can sort of explain the, the transmission mechanism for that part of the asset uh, purchase program as you see it, I've seen some reports questioning how that's actually going to bring you closer to your mandate. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in terms of results, uh, the, we, we see inflation moving forward according to our baseline scenario. If anything, there was a, a better than expected development in recent times when headline inflation moved from minus 0 0.1 to plus 0 0.1. Uh, and that it's essentially due to changes in the price of energy. Uh, but even if we exclude food and energy, we saw a positive development in the services inflation. But we'll also, we should also keep in mind, however, that core inflation is being uh, set at uh, values that where no uptick is being shown now for several months. So I think we, we're moving forward at the pace which was expected according to our baseline. By year end, there are certain base effects on, uh, concerning the oil prices, which will make inflation go up and uh, stay for the next year at 1.2%, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, over the over next year. So we will see these effects by year end. Um, we should also ask the counterfactual. In other words, what our, our monetary policies have been undertaken, our monetary policy measures have been undertaken at the time when we had uh, many other contrary or factors or headwinds going against. So what we should ask ourselves, what would have happened in absence of these monetary policy measures? But when we look at uh, the uh, consequences that uh, the impact that our monetary policy measures had on financial markets, I think there is no doubt that they've been highly effective. The, just to give you an idea of recent, just a few days, the R measure of uh, lending rates, it's a composite average of bank lending rates, is now at a historical minimum. 
we never saw lower rates. The bank lending survey shows that now credit conditions and credit volumes are improving and have been constantly improving now for several months. But even more importantly, when we ask banks, incidentally, the, uh, the lending, bank lending survey was taken before and after the Brexit. And so banks had been given the opportunity to tell us, uh, is this gonna, I mean, is, is, is what happened changing your views? And uh, none of them seem to, to have given an answer to that. So it's, uh, perhaps it's just too early, but we didn't have any, uh, any feedback from Brexit into, the, into their answers. Uh, but basically, uh, so it, it, when we are asking why, are, why is credit going up, what is, what is motivating your lending decisions, they answer competition. Competition between, bankings, ba between banks. When uh, two or three years ago, credit flows were still, uh, were still, credit growth was still negative, the main answer about what is the main motivation behind your lending decision, main answer was risk. So that's the important thing. And then being given this answer about competition being the main driver now for several months. And we consider this to be basically a, a product of our monetary policy measures. So all this will, is being passed through to the real economy. We are seeing this through the sort of gradual uh, economic recovery, which, uh, which uh, is moving forward at, uh, at a steady and moderate pace. Not to mention, of course, all the other figures that I did mention in the past, namely stock prices, namely uh, spreads, spreads between, uh, uh, we can say the fragmentation in the Eurozone is by and large over. So spreads between core countries and periphery. Lending, bank lending is over. Spreads between corporates and SMEs have narrowed down a lot. Excuse me. <coughs> Mr. Canepa? Francesco Canepa, Reuters. You mentioned earlier that there's a need for a public backstop to prevent a possible fire sale of NPLs. So can you expand on that? What, what form could it take? And a second question about NPLs, especially in Italy, which happens to be our country, um, how urgent is need for capital and how big? Because some of the steps you mentioned earlier are steps that are fairly gradual and take time. but. Sometimes the market feels like the problem is urgent and cannot wait. Thank you. Yeah, on the first, the first, uh, the first question asks whether public backstop. Public backstop is uh, is a measure that would be very useful, but certainly should be agreed with the Commission, as according to the existing rules. Uh, it's. Um, it's, it's important and it's, uh, it's, it's even more important given the existing rules. So what shape should it take? All this should be agreed with the Commission, uh, DG competition especially. The second point about the MPLs in Italy, uh, I think the very first measure, well, certainly it's, it's a big problem. It's going to take uh, time. Uh, it has taken time everywhere, by the way, um, to address the MPLs when they, when they reach this size, has taken time more or less everywhere. But the, we should be aware that uh, the longer we have this in place, the less functioning will be the banking system, or at least will be the banks with high NPLs. And so the less capable will be these banks to transmit our monetary policy impulses to the real economy. Also, a high level of NPLs makes banks especially vulnerable to, uh, to the markets. As we've seen recently, 
uh, equity bank equity stocks were hit especially for those banks with a high level of MPLs. And one of the reasons why this is so is that uh, the future level of profitability comes into question because a lot of capital is stuck against this level of MPLs. So on one hand, there is an interest in trying to resolve this, uh, uh, this uh, serious problem as fast as one can. On the other hand, one is bound by the fact that uh, it's by its nature a problem that is low to be resolved. Now, so the question is what can it be done to accelerate the resolution of this problem? And one of the, one of the measures is to have a well-functioning market for MPLs. What is it needed for such a market to develop? Several things, but one is, uh, is I, my view dominant, namely is to create a legislative framework where the MPLs can be traded and sold easily. Some steps have been undertaken in Italy uh, and in recent times there are certainly steps in the right direction. More should be done and uh, should be done especially to address the legacy MPLs, the past stock of MPLs. In other words, the legislative changes should be such that the legacy MPLs could be adequately addressed. Thank you. Mr. Schiretz. Mark Schiretz from the Zeit. I'd like to follow up on what my colleague just said on this proposal on institutional reform. Um, the main idea was that there is not enough appetite in the countries to go ahead with further integration of fiscal policies. So we need a market-based solution which includes debt restructuring and creditor participation and so on and so on, extension of maturities. And I was wondering whether you think this goes in the wrong, in the right direction or uh, it probably should not, or it should better not be undertaken. And the second question, um, the IMF has singled out um, a large Frankfurt-based financial institution um, as one of the main risks for global financial stability. Sorry, the, the, the IMF has singled out one um, large bank here in Frankfurt as a main risk for financial stability. And um, my question would be whether you share these concerns. I, well, the second question is easy to answer. I won't comment on specific banking institutions. Um, on, on the first question, it's... Um, it's very important that uh, the changes that are being suggested may be rational in, in their own sake, uh, but it's very important that they take place in the proper framework. Uh, in other words, can we have a debt restructuring mechanism in absence of a common budget and uh, or somewhat more advanced idea of a common fiscal policy. Uh, are we sure that we have examined all the implications for financial markets, for financial stability, um, and more generally for stability at large, of big changes in the treatment of sovereign debt? So I think these questions or these proposals, which uh, have their own rationality if taken by themselves, ought to be reframed in a, in a sort of a more complete framework than, we, than the one we have today. Mr. Kutamanos. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. President, uh, members of uh, European Parliament have repeatedly called for the EBA to be moved from London to Frankfurt uh, because of the proximity to the ECB. Um, do you support these calls? Do you think that would be desirable? Would it make your work easier? Well, I didn't know that, but I have no... <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't know that, but I have no, no specific view on that. Is there a clear uh, commitment of the ECB systems toward banknotes and coins as a sole legal tender? And if so, why do you bury the 500 euro note? No, I'm sorry. Uh, what is the question? Is the ECB what? 
is there a clear commitment of yeah. the ECB system towards banknotes and coins as sole legal tender? Yeah, of course, there is. No, no, we, did, we didn't bury the 500 euro notes. We, we decided that the 500 euro notes is, uh, is, is a, uh, I would say, is a good, uh, is a good instrument in, uh, in hands that are not exactly proper hands. In other words, uh, is, uh, as someone said, uh, someone said, we don't want to draw seniorage from comfort to criminals. Uh, and... Um, and so we decided to stop production at some years, I think 2018, or if I'm not mistaken, beginning of 2000, end 2018, of, this, uh, of the 500 euro note, but it will stay in circulation and it can be converted any time in the future. Legal tender. So you will have legal tender. Yeah. And second question, uh, is it true that your son is a, a bond dealer in London? And if so, uh, wouldn't it be a, a, a conflict of interest? Well, this very same question was asked to me five years ago when I started this job. I answered that he's not a bank dealer, he's a trader in London, and that's it. And it's not conflict of interest. And the European Parliament didn't believe so. And our final question goes to Ms. Chatterley. President Draghi, I just want to pick up on your point about the solvency of the banks and the improvements that we've seen since the financial crisis and the respective concerns about profitability. I just wonder when we look around Europe and we see some of the largest and the most strategically important banks trading at or around record lows, that suggests something bigger than profitability concerns and even solvency concerns in some cases. Do you think there is still a structural lack of confidence in the European banking sector? And do you think investors are perhaps overemphasizing the risks? And my second question is, we've seen a recovery, a significant recovery in equity markets in particular since the Brexit vote. But the data suggests that international investors are heading for the door. And I think when they look in particularly across the water, they see a, a fractured European Union, they see low growth, high inflation, terrorism, geopolitical risk fueling nationalism, and politicians that are in many cases failing to respond. I just wondered how you respond, both as a European and secondly as the head of the Central Bank of Europe, the Eurozone. Thank you. Um, let me respond to the second question first. Um, our response lies in achieving our mandate and achieving our objective. Our response lies in uh, ensuring what we call price stability, but in fact amounts to growth and job creation. Our response lies in making sure the labor markets continue to improve. And that's our domain. That's, the, that's our job. This is, we consider this to be a very important contribution for also addressing the other sides of uh, our continent that create uh, so much worry in, uh, in uh, the rest of the world's eyes. And, um, and that's what we do. That's what we are accountable for. And that's what we believe we will succeed. On your first question, I don't want to underplay the situation. To say that it's not a solvency problem, but it's a future profitability problem, doesn't mean that one, uh, one underplays the problem. Just uh, um, figure-wise, we, we see that from a solvency viewpoint, our banks are better off than, than years ago. Uh, but certainly, they do have uh, profitability issues, and especially uh, the uh, banks with a high share of MPLs, but not only 
banks with high share of NPLs. Some of it has to do with the weak growth performance of the past few years. But uh, I'm pretty confident that a strong supervision and a robust regulation and better communication, indeed, by the supervisory authorities, the EBA, and all this will still improve the, the situation and the perception in, uh, in, uh, in the rest of the world's eyes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And see some of you at the G20. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.